Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be treasure hunting. I have this box here filled, just filled to the top with random PC parts. I think there's motherboards and a whole lot of cards in here. So in this video, I'm gonna go through this box. We're gonna find out if there's anything interesting and unique in here. Maybe do a little bit of testing, a little bit of investigation, a little bit of talking. So without further ado, Let's get right to it. As far as I'm aware, everything inside this box is for the PC. So we're talking ISA cards, because like that's what I can see sitting here right here on the top, ISA cards, and then maybe some PCI cards. I can see at least one motherboard in there. I don't think we're gonna find anything for anything else. Like there's no Commodore parts or Apple parts in here, but uh, well, we'll see. I don't think that's the case. We have a couple motherboards out on the bench here for testing. So this is my Pentium board that's got PCI slots for testing those types of cards and ISA cards. And then I have an older, 3D6SX motherboard here. This is sort of one that you've probably seen a bunch of times on the bench before. And we have an ATX power supply that's got an AT adapter there. So I can test out any motherboards that are in there, not to mention any of these peripheral cards should hopefully be testable. As far as where all of this stuff came from, this was a donation and this came from a friend, a local friend here in Portland who was cleaning out their storage unit and they found that they had a bunch of PC parts and stuff like that in boxes. So as opposed to letting that stuff all just go to waste, they asked me if I wanted it and I said, sure, that'd make a fun video. So this box has been sitting up in the living room untouched since I got it. And it's actually probably been more like six months now I think about it. So it's time to dig in and hopefully we're gonna find some interesting parts in here. I think the way I wanna approach this is I'm gonna move these motherboards out of the way. This is my test stuff. And we will just take a look, first take a quick look at what's in here we'll go through everything. And then I'll set aside some stuff for further testing, which we can then use these motherboards for. The first thing I'm gonna do is we're just gonna show what it looks like inside this box here. Hopefully that is in focus. Uh, this is how the box is. This was the box that was just sitting on the top. I do have more boxes like this that we can go through. I just figured that this video will probably get too long just going through what's in here. And as you can see, well, this thing is already chocker block full. It's a banker's box and it's completely full. Everything is just stacked in there. In fact, uh, you can kind of see down there, there's just stuff, lots and lots of stuff. All right, so first thing out of the box, it's a Sound Blaster 16. This is a CT2770. I couldn't tell you like where in the grand scheme of thing this falls, but this does not have the OPL3 chip on here, the actual one. So the OPL uh, functionality is emulated inside one of these Creative Labs chips here. So it's, uh, oh, you know, not quite as good, I think, as the real thing. But nonetheless, these types of cards are great. I am a big fan of the Sound Blaster 16, specifically because it just offers wonderful compatibility and it works really well. And this card appears to be in mint condition. One thing I do notice though, is that it does not have the wavetable expansion connector on it. So it's a little bit limited in that regard. Luckily, I have a bunch of other Sound Blaster 16s that do have the wavetable expansion connector. So I use those when I need that. Next up, we have another Sound Blaster card. This is a CT4500. It's an AW64, actually. So it has some onboard memory with a RAM expansion that is possible. And it's funny because I'm pretty sure that Clint um, LGR just recently got one of these from one of his viewers. And oh, I'm noticing that's interesting. There's a little plug in the jack there. Don't know if that really belongs in there or not, but uh, I guess it keeps you from plugging something in accidentally. But yeah, I think Clint recently got one of these and he said he hadn't really played around with this that much. I don't know too much about the AW64 versus the AW32. I actually have 
an A32 card right here that I absolutely love this card actually. So this card right here is a CT3620. And <laughs> to be honest, it got really confusing with Creative Labs. They had so many different iterations of cards and whatnot. I'm pretty sure that this is equivalent to the A32. Whatever this card is, it's like an A32. And when you add the memory here, and I think I have, uh, well, these are four megs, six, I have like eight megs of RAM on here. This allows awesome wavetable synthesis and software can load their, their own patch sets or um, instruments or whatnot into the RAM here for that wavetable synthesis. And this handles all of that software mixing of multiple channels of audio, kind of like what the Amiga can do basically, or a Gravis Ultrasound really, but this is Creative Labs version of it. And uh, I keep this card handy, I keep it sitting over there with my little test cards and stuff whenever I'm working on systems, because this card kind of rocks. It works really well. And um, well, I, I don't really know uh, with this card here, how similar is it to this? Is this uh, a later version of this? Does it have similar memory? Like can software written for the this A32 actually work with that? I don't really know. So if you have good knowledge about those differences, definitely let me know in the comment section below. I'll move that A32 out of the way. But yeah, so far we have these two sound cards and a whole lot more to go. I'm just gonna keep grabbing sound cards because uh, there's a mishmash of cards there. So here is another card. This is a CT4520 and the last one was a 4500. Well, what is the difference? I don't know. Looks like uh, has a similar RAM expansion connector here. Uh, this one obviously is a bit later with a CT4520. This I see here has a higher pin count. Oh, although that one, that one looks the same. What was Creative Labs doing with all these like slight variations? I don't really know. Next up is another sound card. I dug through a little bit to get to this. It's a CT2940. And what was this one again? This was, this was a 2770. So uh, the, the higher the number, the later the card is. So this is the 2900, uh, 2940. So it's definitely a little bit later than this other card. This also lacks the OPL synthesis stuff, which I think would be right around here. So if it had actual OPL3 on there, it does not. Seems to be missing some components here and an audio jack on the back that's just not populated. So yeah, yet another iteration of a Sound Blaster 16. It is just a Sound Blaster 16, but as far as what differentiates this card, for instance, from this card, I don't know. And going into the box, there's another Sound Blaster. This one is a CT2940, which is that the same exact number as this? Yes, it is the same as this, but this one has the expansion connector installed for the CD-ROM. And these are bus transceivers right here. And as you can see, they're not populated on the other one, even though the part number is exactly the same. The rest of the card appears to be identical. Oh, except it does have these components populated, the ones that are missing, and it has that extra jack, which says speaker out. So this is obviously an amplification IC and some support components, and that is just not populated on this one. This card's a little dusty, but this one is definitely a lot more dusty. So I'll probably set aside all the cards that need cleaning and I'll give them a good wash. But for now, we'll just stick them in a pile. And I think the sound cards, um, I can test those all relatively easily because my test bench there has the Sound Blaster software installed on it. So I should be able to just stick it in and at least get those Sound Blaster 16s verified if they work or not. All right, next card is not a sound card. We have an ISA video card, or ISA, PCI video card. We have a Trident, and I can't really read what this is without my goggles, because my eyesight is not working so good. ProVidia 9685. We have extra RAM installed, and I mean, yeah, look at this. There's expansion header here for additional RAM, and I don't know, JTON, it says there. Okay, so we'll need to test that. Next up. We have a 3Com Etherlink 3. These are really good ISA Ethernet cards. So this will be a 10 megabit card. 
and not much to say about these other than I think I've talked about these before. The really nice thing about these particular cards, they have excellent DOS compatibility. They have packet drivers that work in DOS. Therefore, you can use DOS network drivers to get on the internet, TCP IP, stuff like that. It's MTCP IP suite or MTCP is the name of the suite. Works really well with these cards. So these are absolutely excellent. Next card is this one, which is an interesting little guy. I'm gonna say this is like a bus mouse card. Uh, looks like it is. That's the bus mouse connector right there. What's interesting is this little extra connector right here. That is intriguing. So it's part of the 16-bit header, but it's only a tiny piece of it, and it's only got two contacts in it. So this will obviously be for some higher IRQs, I would imagine interrupt request, but the rest of this card is completely 8-bit on the other hand. There's some dip switches here that allow you to select the base I.O. from 282 A0, 330, or 340. Oh, and it's a Logitech is the brand name on here. And it says Logitech Juliet 2 card. So this will be a Logitech bus mouse card. All right, next treasure in the box is a motherboard. Let's move these cards out of the way a little bit. We have a 486 motherboard here. So this thing is populated with an AMD DX4 120, 72 pin SIM sockets, onboard IO. We have PCI, ISA of course, CR2032 for the battery. So no battery leakage risk here. And then of course this motherboard has onboard cache memory with tag memory it looks like, which should speed up access even faster. This motherboard sports an SIS chipset. Part number on the board here is 46F55. And the SIS chipset is an 85C497. And this is under a sticker here. Let's move the sticker. Uh, it looks like 496 for that one. A few things about this board is it has plastic SIM sockets for the memory, and that's not great, although they haven't broken, so that's a positive. We have a zero insertion force socket here for the CPU. And that's nice. It does support the overdrive, it looks like. And on the back of the board, it's in very nice shape. It's got a couple of these little standoffs on here for AT cases. It's in mint shape otherwise. So hopefully this can work. This will need a heatsink installed on it. It does say heatsink and fan required here for that CPU. It's got the voltage regulator here to support the 3.3 or whatever, 3.5 volts that this thing runs at. And yeah, multi IO on board. So a very complete and a very late 46 motherboard. I have no idea how good the performance is of this board, especially with the PCI slots and stuff. It seems to be, at least what we see here, a pretty capable motherboard, at least uh, with what peripherals are on the, the motherboard here. All righty, next thing, we have a little card in a bag here. Okay, this is just a standard multi IO card. So IDE floppy, we have game port looks like, and two serial plus has a parallel port built in. Looks like there's space for a nine pin connector there that the header is missing. And it's a wind bond card, W83757F, like Frank. Not too much to report here. These are absolutely necessary if you're running an older motherboard, like a 46 motherboard that doesn't have any onboard IO. And the funny thing is, I remember early on when I started working on retro computers, uh, you know, I'd be getting old PC parts, either donations or I'd buy them off eBay and stuff like that. And I would need a card like this. And, you know, these things were like dime a dozen back in the day because every 386, 46, you know, you had to use these types of cards, these ISA multi IO cards, and they were cheap and ubiquitous. But now when you need one, well, at least last time I looked, you know, you'd have to go spend like 40 bucks on one of these on eBay. And, you know, it's just funny because they're so common and they were common and I'm sure, you know, they still are. But I guess when you need one, you need one and people are gonna charge what they're gonna charge um, to get, get these cards out there into the market. All right, next card is a little unusual, it's big. Let's make sure I'm zoomed out all the way here. Oops, the wrong way. DDA-08-16, PC-9172, and some other numbers on there. My feeling is what this card is, and if we zoom in here and look at it a little bit, pretty sure what this is, this is going to be some type of, I don't know, IO card, basically used in something like manufacturing to control a bunch of 
inputs and outputs. So imagine you have an assembly line, you have some software that runs on a PC that controls it. Well, this card, which is only half populated, so I'm assuming like by the fact it says eight slash 16 here, it probably supports eight channels or 16 channels of IO. And this must be like the eight channel version. Well, half populated, look at these toggles here. You have switches, we got um, like the potentiometers up here, dip switches there. It's a 16 bit ISA card. And if we look at the end here, this is the breakout card. So it actually has, it's not just eight slash 16, this actually goes all the way up to what, 37 IO lines. So these are basically, you can uh, put wires in there, use a, a tool like this. You loosen that, you stick a wire in there. And this obviously can come off. It looks like you can unscrew these here. But this kind of stuff is pretty cool. Now, of course, you need special software to address, you know, the ports that are on this card, or you need to at least have uh, the knowledge of how to write software that can talk directly to the ports that are on this particular card. And of course, nowadays we have things like Arduino and Raspberry Pis with GPIO libraries, and we would just use that stuff. And it's like super duper easy to write in uh, for the Arduino, for instance, to turn IO lines off and on. But in the old days, you did have to do it on a PC and you'd use cards like this to do it. And understandably, they're probably somewhat expensive. Now looking at this card, it's my hunch that something like this chip here is what interfaces to the bus and that, that these four chips here, well, there's two that are actually installed, but the four that are possible are the IO like uh, transceivers basically. So you would be programming the registers on these chips to turn off and on these IO lines. And the fact that these have all these potentiometers and stuff, maybe these are analog capable. So there's like an analog to digital type board as well. So for acquisition of sensors and projects and stuff like that, any of that is possible. Now, unfortunately without manuals and with, especially without the software that goes with this, there's really no way for me to even test or use this thing. I wouldn't know the first thing about getting this thing to work, but it's just kind of a cool card as an example of what was necessary back in the day before we had simple stuff like Arduinos, which you could use for any type of automation you wanted now without having to do any complex programming. Back then, it was a different story. All right, while editing the video, I looked up what DDA-08-16 is, and this card is not just something that's lame. It's a Keithley card. Keithley is owned by Tektronix now, and it seems that the entire user guide is available online. Let's jump to the overview of the card. So the DD-08 or DD-16 are analog output boards compatible with the driver links software. So major features of the card, two four channel digital to analog converters, quad DACs on the DDA-08 provide eight analog outputs, four quad DACs on the DDA-16 provide 16 analog outputs. Multiple analog output channels can be included in an update group and updated simultaneously. Switch selectable output signal with voltage output or current output is supported for each of the quad DACs. And five unipolar or bipolar switch selectable voltage output ranges are supported with a current range from 4 to 20 milliamps. All onboard switches can be read by software and an onboard internal pacer clock is provided. You select the update rate through software. And when it comes to software, it seems that this thing included the driver link software for Windows, and there's some high level programming libraries and stuff available for it as well. And here's the block diagram for the card. So the ISA bus here is on the left, and that large package, I guess, is an FPGA, which sounds very fancy for the time. And then we have the quad DAX. So this card is only populated with two of them, so it's the eight channel model. And I guess the fully populated one would be the 16 channels, but this card is far more fancy than I thought it was on the surface with these very fancy quad DACs. Let me see if I can find the specs for them. And here we go at the end and the appendix has the specs. So 12 bit DAC temperature offset drift is 15 PPM full scale range. And there are the various voltage ranges it supports zero to 10 volts all the way through plus or minus 10 volts. And looking at this thing here, output clocks and things like that, I don't quite understand any of this stuff. It's all somewhat sophisticated, but either way, this card is fancy and probably was a very expensive part back in the day. Alrighty, next card. What is this? I don't even know what this is. It's an ISA card, obviously. We have a nine pin connector. This looks like a DB9, like it would be VGA, or sorry, VGA, like CGA or MDA. But then we have these RCA jacks there. And looking up here on the board, it says MOX-16, copyright 1989, Music Quest Incorporated. Music Quest. 
is this is this like a MIDI card maybe? So we have SRAM right here. We got a ROM. It says Music Quest Incorporated there. Copyright 1989. And then we have this large Zilog chip right here. Z8800A20PSC Super 8 ROMless System on Silicon from 1990. Interesting. Very interesting card. Not much to report on the back here. Just a few stamps. Yeah, I gotta look up what this is. The MOX-16. Okay, I found a post here. Today, I was gonna take a look at one of my older PCs, DTK. And here it is. The second sound card I decided to add was a MIDI card. There it is, the MOX-16. That is absolutely the card. Ooh, okay. So there's a breakout cable that goes from the nine pin to the two MIDI ports. The Music Quest, it's an MQX, I was saying MOX, MQX16 8-bit card for games that happen to support MIDI sound, most commonly in the era of the MT32. This card is intelligent mode compatible, so many games that use that mode, for instance, May Sierra games, will run without issue. Okay, so I have no MT32 for any kind of testing, and of course I do not have the little breakout cable at well. We'll keep looking through this box, but I doubt that there's the cable in there. So I guess the question is, if anyone knows the pinout of this nine pin on here, and also like, what do these RCA jacks do? Definitely let me know. That would be fun to uh, build a little breakout cable for this. And I could at least try to test it out with the sound canvas. And then maybe one day if I get an MT32, I can actually have an intelligent mode card. I have very limited knowledge on this, but I think, at least my understanding is that the MPU-401 card, the or at least the Roland card that came with the MT32 for using it with the PC, is very rare and kind of expensive. And I think there's some replicas now. So that's kind of cool that this MQX-16 might be something that might work with it. But again, how does this work exactly? So manual would be needed. And of course the breakout or pinout for this connector here. I just did some super fast looking for manuals or pinouts and stuff like that for this card, but I was unable to find anything. Um, there's definitely chit chat about this card, but nothing immediately came up. All right, next card, we have a VGA card. This is an ISA VGA card, so 8-bit one. These are pretty helpful because they work really well on XT class machines. Of course, you could use it on later ones as well. They just run a lot slower because they are lacking that 16-bit data bus. I'm trying to read what this says. It says AMI VGA BIOS. On the back here it says BVGA card and ID 1000653. The card's really dirty, so it's gonna need a good wash. I just took a quick look at the FCC ID right here and it comes up as laser computer. So that would be VTech. So that makes sense. I think I've seen one of these cards on the channel before then because when I worked on that leading technologies computer had an 8-bit ISA card in it. I bet you it was something very similar to this. I'm gonna stick this in the pile that's going to need to be washed. All right, moving on to the next card. Um, we actually have an Apple card here. So this is for an Apple II, and this is the ROM card, as it says right there. And what this card allows you to do is this would go in something like an Apple II Plus, and it would go into slot zero, where you might otherwise have a memory card in there. And it allows you to switch the computer with this toggle switch right here between AppleSoft Basic and Integer Basic. So when the computer was upgraded from the original Apple II Integer Basic ROMs to the um, Apple II Plus, well, it broke compatibility with some older software. So with a card like this, all I had to do was flip the switch and the computer would power up directly into Integer Basic and flipping it would allow you to use the motherboard ROMs, which would be AppleSoft Basic or vice versa. What was on the motherboard was Integer Basic and this had AppleSoft Basic. I think these cards kind of fell out of favor a little bit because later you wanted to have a RAM expansion. You put that in slot zero and you could have an extra ROM on that card as well. Although once you had the RAM expansion, the language card it was called, then you could actually load integer basic into RAM and it would act as ROM. So that would allow you to what well, would eliminate the need for a card like this because you could just booted a floppy disk and it would load the integer basic and then the software could keep running and you didn't need this anymore. You just had a little extra step at the boot process. 
Okay, next card. We have a weird, weird card here. What is this? What the heck is this thing? This is, this is wild. What, look at this, look at this mess. All right, first off, what is this ceramic package here? <laughs> is this a video card? Yes, it looks to be a video card. And the reason why I say that is if we zoom in here, you can see that that is a RAM DAC. So that's what converts the video memory or like the digital signals that are contained within memory into a video signal, like an analog video signal that would then go to a monitor. And looking at the back here, there appears to be just a standard nine pin connector. So that must be analog video. And then we have dip switches, but this looks like some kind of prototype card for sure. When we start over here, um, oh no, I felt something on the bottom here. There's some bodge wires that have come off. Um, there are some kind of memory modules here, but these are really small modules. These are not standard. These are not standard, they're SIPs but they are soldered onto the board and these are way smaller than the normal memory module. In fact, do I have any memory modules sitting right here? I do not. Um, oh, well, here we do. We can compare it to what's on there. So there we go. Those are standard 30 pin memory modules. SIPs would be the same. And you can see that there's a substantial difference in size there. Flipping around to the other side, we have this, which is definitely memory here. And it looks like there is the capability of having more memory along the top edge here. Maybe also something plugged in with a module right there. There's some headers there, there. Actually, there's a whole lot of headers all over this board here and here. And then this thing is like super duper bodge-tastic. Look at this thing. Now there are a couple EEPROMs on here. And as you see here, it says HBV0 comma one. And same thing, I guess, high and low. So 16 bit doesn't really give away what uh, this card might be. Lots of pals or gals there. Lots of lots of things. Okay, and we have a TI chip there. We have a TMS 34010FNL. Is this the video processor? I know TI was really big into making video processors at some point back in the day, and there were a bunch of cards, I think I've shown some on the channel, that use a, a chip potentially like this. According to Mauser here, it says, Application Specialized Graphics System Processor. There is a data sheet. I think this is for this particular chip. Nope, that does not work. <laughs> well, it looks like this super sketchy data sheet site here has a data sheet here. So there it is, Graphics System Processor. It is the dash 40 that's on this board. So 200 nanosecond instruction cycle time. Programmable one, two, four, eight, or 16 bit pixel size with, with 16 Boolean and four arithmetic pixel processing options. Got registers, onboard cache, direct interfacing to both conventional DRAM and multi-point or multi-port video RAM. Yeah, so this is definitely the graphics processor on here. So this is some type of a potentially like high res graphics board, but we're obviously talking about some type of prototype here. Now, fortunately on the back, we have a whole bunch of bodges. Most seem to be intact except for these two. And unfortunately it's not obvious where these wires went. So I might have to break out the magnifying, um, I don't know, the microscope try to figure out where these went and then reattach the, them. This one down here kind of kind of fits that it would go to the edge of this bodge right here, but I don't know. And really, unfortunately, with stuff like this, probably not functional, like this thing's not gonna work if these bodges aren't attached. Uh, I mean, of course, what are the chances of this board even working? I mean, what is this board even? This is a, just a wild thing. Did this turn into something that was actually used in production or what? I mean, the whole thing is so funny. It does have a little sticker on here that says, okay. Really quickly, after I was looking at the card, I noticed that there was some writing on the edge here, Vectrix Corp, and there's a part number. So I'm hoping some of my viewers who are good internet sleuths might be able to find a little bit of information about this card. I found some info about the company, but nothing about a card like this. So yeah, that is uh, very fascinating. Unfortunately, with these types of cards, even though this obviously has some ROM activity here, 
a lot of times they needed special drivers to do anything. I don't think like you couldn't put this in and replace your VGA card. A lot of times this would work in concert with another card or it might work in DOS, but it'd be very slow because it's sort of emulating CGA or whatever. And then once you run AutoCAD or whatever your software is with the special drivers, then this card will take over and then, you know, start to have good performance. It is wild to see a card like this, though, with so many custom chips, all these PALs, all of this stuff was like handmade, I guess, or, you know, maybe this wasn't handmade, but all this bodging going on. Just mysterious. Very, very mysterious. We can definitely try plugging this into a computer, see if it does anything at all, but I'm not holding out hope that this card's going to do anything, at least uh, not with these two bodge wires that are missing. Okay, next up, this is interesting. So this is the whole lot of PCBs, all blank, all unpopulated for something called scan cap. Where are my magnifiers here? Scan cap, copyright 1991 conversion technology. Look at this, scan cap, conversion technology. And this card, unlike this, uh, the last video card we looked at, actually has a VGA header here, plus some additional connectors there. And obviously there would be some type of, uh, you know, slot bracket that would go on there. And looking at the backside, just a really nicely made gold PCB. Looks sweet. And it's pretty hilarious that we have, uh, looks like a whole stack of these. In fact, there might be more in the box. I, I just grabbed these off the top. But that's what we got. Some tape on those ones. But um, yeah, let's see what we got going on in here. Yep, there are a bunch more. Oh, it looks like there are some assembled ones too. All right, um, this is something else. It says Jovian Logic Corp, copyright 1988. Totally unpopulated. A little bit of corrosion right here on the edge. Jovian, huh. Whatever could this be? Similar to the uh, this card though, and it has a, a nine pin connector versus a DB, um, an HD15 or whatever it's called, the 15 pin VGA connector. But look how it has these same headers, which look very similar. That's interesting. And what's this? Another unpopulated board. This one says Blackfoot, copyright 1991 Arroyo Technologies. Why are these all these unpopulated boards in here for um, different companies? Oh, I just noticed this is not an ISA card. This is potentially a new bus card, like one for a Macintosh 2. This is definitely what would be on a Mac, I think. Although there doesn't appear to be what would be like a header. These are probably like resistors, although maybe those are um, connectors of some kind. So there's some kind of a slot cover that goes there. And then the new bus connector goes in the side and then plugs into the motherboard. It's a right angle type connector. So the Blackfoot from Arroyo Technologies. Anyone recognize that? Yeah, okay, we got more, more of these unpopulated. And then there are more of these Blackfoot cards also unpopulated. So we got at least uh, four PCBs for those. This one here, this Jovian thing more of those and then yeah it looks like we got some populated ones in here so let's keep digging through the box let's pull out this bag here all right all right well there it is there are the populated cards <laughs> these are like mostly populated so the date codes on here are all from around 91 or so and that just matches the date here on the bottom this is the scan cap. We have two crystals here, 53 and 50 megahertz. A couple bodges there. Uh, TDA 8703, whatever that is. And just like I thought, we have a VGA type connector, two RCAs, and then we have some dip switches. So what is this thing? Let me go look this up. Scan cap by Conversion Technology. Yeah, that does not come up at all. ISA 16-bit. I mean, I, I don't know what else to type in here. Uh, 1991. 
I mean, no, there's nothing at all. This thing is totally unknown, totally unknown. So yeah, what the heck is this thing? So because there's no ROM on these, my thought is that these cards aren't gonna do anything at all, not without the software that goes with them. And <laughs> like, we can't even find any, any info at all on these, let, let alone the software or the manual. So yeah, that's a curiosity. And I still can't believe all these PCBs here. <laughs> so funny. And look, digging in the box here, there's definitely more. Uh, here's another couple of these. Uh, looks like these two are missing a couple ICs right there. Uh, in fact, they're missing a few ICs. Uh, this one is populated though with all of the ICs and sockets. How about the, the other one in the bag there? No, that one's missing everything as well. This seems to be the only one that's got it. And these are PAL chips or GAL chips. So these are programmable. And without those being programmed, these cards are definitely not gonna work. So at least one of these is fully programmed. And oh, this one's got bodges on it. Check this out. Bodge City right here. <laughs> it's got one one of the GALs installed. I'm not even sure if that is a GAL or not, but uh, yeah, fascinating. No bodges on that one though. And we got more. This one's got, um, these ICs are populated. Are those installed? Oh, those are just started right on the board on the other ones. Okay, so varying states of assembly. And then look at this one. This one has both of these ICs installed, plus these uh, stickers all over the place. Uh, but yeah, it's missing these ICs. So yeah, it's, um, very, very mysterious. <clears throat> and digging in the box, looks like there's another one of these. So I got these coming out my uh, backside here. This one's got the ICs there, has a bodge right there. Backside of the board has a bodge as well. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. But as I said, I'm pretty sure because there's no ROMs on here that plugging this in to uh, a motherboard won't do anything whatsoever. All right, well, digging in the box, now we have some more of these Blackfoot cards and they're assembled. So as I suspected, this is definitely for a Macintosh Mac 2. So there's that new bus connector right there. We have these custom ICs and they are, they are not even marked. Look at this, nothing, no markings whatsoever. Fascinating, very dusty as well. Arroyo Technologies, same for this one here. We got no markings at all, and we're missing a ROM chip. We have some SRAM, but yeah, ROM chip missing in action. Oh, but look, another card, and it's got the ROM on here. Unfortunately, it's soldered onto the board, but maybe what I can do is desolder that. Oh, okay, it's not soldered onto the board. It's just sitting on there. Uh, why don't I just put this in here? Oh, the pins are all bent. Let's pop this in here just to keep it in the right spot. All right, so at least we have one potentially completed Blackfoot by Royo Technologies. Unknown if this uh, EEPROM here, which I'll stick a little tape on, is actually programmed or anything, considering it was just sitting on that other board. All right, there we go, cover that up. And on the back side, there are no bodges. And then on this other board here, everything is just sitting on here. None of this stuff is attached. In fact, even the new bus connector here, it had, it's screwed down, but I can tell the pins are not soldered on. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, every single part on here is just placed on the board. And it actually has jumpers, unlike the last one, which has actual soldered ones. What is this thing, really? What the heck is this? And I did a quick search for Blackfoot by Arroyo Technologies, a new bus. Nothing, nothing comes up at all. I don't know, this is like random stuff. I don't think any of this is related at all. Okay, so I made a bit of a mess here. So let me try to organize a little bit. So all of these weird ISA cards that we don't know what they do, move these off to the side here. And then of course, all the associated <laughs> blank PCBs that go with it. And then we have that Blackfoot card fully assembled, one that's not assembled at all. We have blank PCB and we have three more blank PCBs. There it is. Okay, digging in the box some more. Aha, there are more of these cards. This are the Blackfoot cards. 
So, oh, sweet, okay. This, <laughs> this one looks a lot more complete. It's got a ROM here that has a sticker on it. It's definitely missing some parts though, but check these out. These aren't unmarked anymore. They have little keepers on them as well. The ADSP 2105 from 1991, analog devices. That's an interesting socket. That doesn't look, it's like some kind of zero insertion force version of a PLCC socket. And on this side of the board, we have a couple more of those as well. So that's cool. So this thing may have a better ROM in here. Uh, maybe one of these is complete. Obviously this has this, so this chip that's missing on here, but I think that was populated on the other one. So that's a good sign. So maybe mixing and matching, like taking this ROM, putting it on the other board might make one working board. I don't know, but we have more. Look, another one here. This one looks even more complete. So it has a 2764. It's actually been uh, written, I guess. That chip is the one that was missing there, is actually installed. These are installed as well. This particular example looks as production ready as possible, especially because the ROM is in there um, actually on the board. What we will need to do on these boards and for instance on like this weird board here is actually see about reading the ROMs out of the board because maybe that'll give us some clues as to what these things do as well. And it looks like, by the way, there is another one of these. This one maybe is not as complete. Oh no, it's it's complete as well. It's just missing the, the slot bracket on the end there. Everything else on here appears to be in place, including the soldered, um, you know, one-time programmable ROM there. The gal chip there, gal, yeah, okay. What on earth are these cards? Yeah, just, Totally mysterious Macintosh cards, obviously designed by some company here in Oregon, I guess. And somehow my friend ended up with this stuff and then I ended up with it. Alrighty, we are still working through the box. There's some very interesting looking stuff in here still. I will leave some of that for later. Okay, what is this? This looks like a normal VGA card, but not quite so normal. It says Eclipse 2. What the heck is the Eclipse 2? Porticom Technologies, copyright 1991-1992, FCC ID. And then this I see here, I mean, what is that? I don't even recognize. What is this I see right here? I don't even know, the 86C911. We have a couple ROM chips right here and we have a RAM DAC right there and the VGA expansion connector or not expansion, I don't know what that's called. The, uh, you know, you plug in your video capture cards or your overlay cards for MPEG decoding. And then look at these exposed dip switches on the back. And for a VGA card, kind of unusual. So that's a bit weird. All right, next card. What is this? What the freaking heck is this? So this card, as you can see here, has an in, out, aux, and a MIDI connector. So another nine pin made in the USA. There's a serial number. And then here's an FCC ID. I'm gonna have to go look that up in a second. So we have an ISA card here. We have a Motorola DSP here, a 56001. I think those were used on like the Macintosh 840AV Quadra machine. It like adds some extra DSP capabilities. I think that DSP might have also been used on the next workstations. And then we have a couple Alteras here. Are these like CPLDs or something? I'm not sure what those are, but some type of Altera chip. And then we have some DRAM right here. Dip switches are right there. There are four switches. Looks like a wavetable expansion connector. I mean, this is some kind of sound card, but it's a very fancy sound card. One that has a Motorola DSP on it. This thing was had some serious horsepower, at least, uh, well, compared to the Sound Blaster 16, for instance. All right, people are probably screaming at their screen. It appears this is some kind of Turtle Beach Systems card. TBS MSN dash PC01 audio interface card, but yeah, which which Turtle Beach card is this? I'm not super familiar with all their cards, but the fact that it's got some serious horsepower on it, it's just very interesting. All right, and Vogons to the rescue, a little searching here has revealed that this is the Turtle Beach Multi Sound Tahiti. So there it is, the Motorola 56001 and has the same Alteras and whatnot on there. Is this card any good? This is a great card. Motorola DSP is amazing. 
And yeah, reading through this, looks like you can definitely get the software for this card, and um, there's some amount of game compatibility. I love it, so I'm gonna put a link to, <laughs> to their website, which doesn't, doesn't give you anything relevant. I guess this link was put there in 2014, when there probably was something available on there. Anyways, uh, yeah, so I don't know much about these cards. I'm definitely curious to know, is this worth playing around with it all? Definitely would take a little bit more work than I have in this video to try to get this working, but I am going to write on here with a marker uh, just to say, tell me what this thing is, it's Tahiti. Save the future work, <laughs> Turtle Beach TB. I'm just going to put TB Tahiti on there. That way I know in the future. But yeah, I guess put comments down below if you think this is a worthwhile card to play around with, or is this really more of a curiosity and potentially like a Windows 95 type sound card without good DOS compatibility or whatnot. As I said, I always seem to gravitate towards the Sound Blaster 16 cards because those cards are just really easy to use. They have such wide ranging compatibility with just everything that you don't have to fuss around trying to get software working on them. And there's no you know specific drivers for the odd piece of software or whatever, it just works. But a card like this is gonna have some kind of like multi-channel fanciness with these DSP on here that should be potentially better than the Sound Blaster. But again, I don't really know. And obviously when I have something like my A32 right here, which has wavetable synthesis, I think from EMU, that's the people that, uh, this is the processor on this thing that does the wavetable stuff. I think it might be more powerful than this chip, but I think it's later in the generations as well than that. But anyways, like I said, if you have any thoughts about this Tahiti card and whether I should be investigating it further, definitely let me know. All right, let's keep going in this box here. There's just weird stuff. Look at this. Like, what? what is this? Some kind of video card, I guess. Um, it's missing its slot connector. We have an ISA 8-bit card. We have a nine pin on the end. We have a ton of memory here. Let's see what part number this RAM is here. TMS 4161. So two of these chips together is 16 kilobytes. 8-bit wide. So that would mean this right here is 64K of RAM, which means that we have, what, 256K, 320K of video memory, which is a strange amount, to be honest. Um, but yeah, underneath, um, well, we got bodges. They are attached. That's a good thing. No kind of name or whatever on here. Oh, it looks like I can just pop this RAM board off, though, so let's do that. All right, so, oh, okay, well, it revealed a little bit more about the card. Turbo Graphics. <laughs> it's Turbo. Aha, look at this. Copyright 1985 Orchid, Orchid Technologies. I'm assuming this is a RAM DAC of some kind. And then, um, and then these chips here have little handwritten labels on them that luckily haven't fallen off yet. And look at this, 6845, so a CRTC controller, and it says Rev A right there. Why don't I do a quick search for an Orchid Turbo Graphics? The search result turned up this card, the Turbo EGA 286 accelerator. So it's not this is not what I have on the bench here. This appears to be maybe a similar card, but also has a 286 accelerator built in. Not the manual, but the uh, advert, and that doesn't work. Unfortunately, I found with Orchid stuff, a lot of the manuals have been lost. A lot of the original software and things like that are gone. And looking around here, I really don't find anything for this. So that is definitely not the same card. I mean, it's big and similar and it's made by Orchid, but not the same. This card may just work as an EGA or a CGA card though, so it may be worth checking out or plugging back together and putting it into the motherboard when we do some testing. It's funny, this card doesn't have any, well, looks like it maybe had some standoffs. So there'd be little plastic standoffs here that would hold this card in place because it's kind of, um, as Dave Jones would say, it's flapping around in the breeze here. You wouldn't really want it to like touch like that. So. Could be the reason why the, the back cover is missing here is that someone like stripped this down or took it for parts or maybe this card is broken and 
this is all that's left. I don't know. But yeah, mysterious orchid video card. Hmm. Been a few weird video cards in here so far. Okay, let's keep going. There's there's more weird stuff in here. I think we kind of got to the to the very strange things. All right, this board, this appears to be a RAM expansion board that's stuck in here. There we go. This is an S100 bus RAM expansion card. Now this is actually kind of useful because uh, I have a friend who is looking for one of these for his Altair. And um, I actually have the Altair, I borrowed it. And I'm gonna be making a video in the future. So definitely will be worth checking this out. So this is the Z16, which I'm assuming means 16 kilobytes of memory. I'm sure these packages here are um, really obscure and they're from 1978. They're made by Semi, whoever that is. Let's uh, zoom in so you can see for yourself. What are those chips? I don't know, some kind of SRAM I'm sure. And uh, looking at this thing here, we uh, have like some select, select wires there. This is probably, yep, this is um, a 154. I knew that's what that was. It's a pretty common chip for selecting ROM chips or selecting memory and things like that. The pet uses one of these, in fact. And yeah, this is an S100 bus card. This would go into an Altair or an MSI or any machine like that. So I won't be able to test that now. I don't have the machine up and running and I don't even have my own S100 bus computers of any kind. If anyone would ever like to donate one of those, that would be freaking amazing. But um, at least I was able to borrow my friends who this will go to because he has been looking forever and he's been a really good friend. And he's given me a lot of great stuff over the years. So uh, that will definitely go back to him. We have another video card here, I guess. Uh, looks like it's got a VGA connector and a nine pin. Is this another Orchid card? Let's get my goggles on here. It says Heath, part number 150-307. Heath, as in like Heath kit, I guess. I don't know. Chips and technology though. We got a RAM DAC there. So this is definitely like a VGA slash EGA type card. These are interesting. It's funny, A, that it's also only got 8-bit. So it's gonna be kind of slow if you're gonna use it for VGA. This is curious though, very curious, definitely. It's going to be worth testing this thing out and seeing exactly what it does. Uh, there's the video memory, custom chips. I mean, a very early example of a video card that does VGA and EGA. 1987. 1987. So pretty early on in the grand scheme of things when it comes to video cards. Okay. I found a post on Vogons about this card, specifically the Heath 150-307-3 Chips EGA VGA card. One interesting tidbit here is it says that this is actually an EGA card with a VGA connector. It is not the other way around like those Sang ET3000 cards, which are VGA cards that happen to support EGA or digital output as well. But while it's an EGA card, it does appear that this supports VGA-like resolution, so you can use a VGA monitor with it. This thread does have the BIOS dumps for this card. If anyone is interested, I'll put a link to this in the description. All right, we're getting down. There aren't that many more cards here. This is, is this a compact card? Yes, it is a compact card. Compact sticker right there. But this is some kind of a video card. It says VDU controller GA2. This is definitely some kind of video card for the compact portable. Now I couldn't tell you which one. I thought the card I have in my portable, which is an original portable, is taller than this. But notice how it has these extra connectors here. I think this one over here on the left is what connects to the internal monitor. And this displays CGA and MDA, kind of does both. It's able to auto switch between the two. I think this should still work on a regular PC, just plugged into a regular CGA output here. And we should be able to see if this thing works or not. All right, next up, we got this which is a proto board for an ISA. Oh, and it's been uh, populated by someone at some point in the past. So they ran the wires there to this IC right here. This is a GAL 22V10. We have uh, 374, so it looks like that's a latch, plus this little IC up here. So I don't know, pretty simple little thing here. Goes to a 25 pin connector and who knows what this does exactly? It does something. 
All right, next up is this card. And this card, I'm not 100% sure what this is. It says copyright 1985, Centrum Systems West, which is also written along the edge there. We have a Zilog 8530 PSC, SCC, like super serial controller maybe. On the back, we have a nine pin connector, but this is not the right nine pin connector for serial. That would be the other gender. Rev D, top, what about dates? 1984, 1985, so from the, the 80s. Yeah, what is this? I don't know. We could try plugging this into the 36SX, see if it shows up as like a CGA or an MDA card, but actually, you know what? That's not possible because a card like that would need video memory and this has only TTL logic on here, it has no video memory. Ah, uh, yes, okay, and absolutely, it is a super serial type chip. Functions as serial to parallel, parallel to serial communication controller. And when it's talking about parallel, by the way, it's talking about like the 8-bit data bus that's on this card. So that would be a parallel 8-bit going to a serial. I don't know, this is a weird card because I'm pretty sure this is not gonna be standard with any normal PC type serial card because those use 16550s or 8550s, I think, as the serial controller chip. I think that's like an Intel part, and that's the normal like registers that people expect for a serial port on the PC. Software basically is designed to work with those chips because that's what IBM put on their first serial card in the IBM. So it could be that this is just like a non-standard type serial card that had its own drivers or its own software that came out very early on with the PC and wasn't just trying to copy exactly what IBM did. As I've said a bunch of times, if you have any thoughts about this card and you recognize that maybe this is some special serial card, let me know. But uh, definitely off the top of my head, I do not recognize this card at all. And I'm back again while editing. It looks like this card is a PC local talk card. So Apple talk for the PC. Here is Centrum Systems West and 10322 Rev D is what is written on this card. Compatibility C Note 2. Centrum became part of Sun Microsystems and then were spun off as Sitka. Now it begs the question is how exactly would you use this card? So there it is. Tops may require specific drivers that do not exist. Centrum Systems West, West Sun slash Tops and Tangent Cards only appear to work with Tops software and drivers are not available for the most common Apple share client packages. One thing that is for sure in this picture, unfortunately, is too small to look at, but that nine pin connector that's on here is the same connector that was on the original Mac 512 and 128, which makes sense that you, you plug in your little Apple Talk box into that. Okay, we're almost to the end. There's just one more card and what's in this little bag here. All right, so this appears to be some kind of a CPU upgrade. Now, looking at the pinout on the bottom, we're definitely talking about a 46 here. Pretty sure this is the same exact pinout of a 46. It's got three pins across there. Or is this a 386? You know what? We have the 46 right here. So yeah, definitely has the same footprint as the actual 46, the AMD chip that was on that motherboard we looked at earlier. This appears to be some type of an upgrade though. So it says TC 5X. 86 slash 133, ooh, 133. And then take a look down there. You can see there's a surface mount chip and this has this uh, fan attached to it, which says turbo chip by Kingston. Let's look that up. And there it is, the turbo chip. And this will certainly be some kind of like AMD chip or whatever. And yes, it's the AM5X86P75, which is a 46DX4133, yes, really quadrupled. The Kingston Turbo Chip came in an upgrade package to boost the 46 to Pentium 75 performance. Hence, AMD named the CPU the AM5X86P75. The Kingston solution runs fine, but is slower compared to the real ceramic stuff. I suspect the faster one has right back L1 cache, whereas the slower one has a right through L1 cache. And there it is, there's the part. So I guess um, AMD made an actual ceramic version of the chip that would have been very similar to this one that was designed to go into the later motherboards. But with these turbo chips like this, this will have built-in voltage regulation right on board with this little PCB. That, that means you could plug this into any old 46 machine, even ones that do not support the fancy chips like this one. 
older 46 motherboards only support 5 volts and don't support the 3.3 volts that this requires. So therefore, this is a great solution. And this, of course, I think is going to be even faster than this, or at least theoretically. All right, let's just move these off to the side and let's take a look at the very last thing in here which is weird and unusual. <laughs> okay, so this, I mean, I don't know much about this, but we have an ISA 8-bit card and on it has this board here, which would plug in the motherboard because it's got a 3D6 type connector and the pins are a mess. I'm gonna have to try to very carefully bend that back. And it's got a 3D6 DX processor right there of the 33 megahertz variant. And as you can see, this has some buffers or whatever going on and this very thick shielded ribbon cable. Unfortunately, oh, I wonder if it's broken. Yes, yeah, it appears that there's actually a break right there. That's annoying. So it got cut at some point. Anyways, it's got this long ribbon cable here that goes into this card. And look at this, the Periscope Model 4 Revision 2. And copyright 1990, the Periscope Company Incorporated. It was my understanding, and I've done a little bit of reading about the Periscope because I have a few other Periscope cards, although nothing like this one. You plug the CPU here with this little card into the computer under test, and the machine runs code as normal on this 3D6. But what this Periscope card allows you to do is with a separate PC, you can halt the execution of the, this computer that's running on the 3A6 and then do debugging in real time. And I think it's like hardware debugging, software debugging. You can look into the memory. You can do all sorts of cool things. You can take control of that other system while it's in mid-operation and then do all sorts of stuff with it. I'm pretty sure with this card, if we look at it, it has an RCA jack on the end here. Pretty sure there's like a foot pedal that you would uh, be using to do that interruption. So this machine would be running away, say playing a game or whatever it's doing, and then something weird happens, and then as quickly as possible, you push that foot pedal, which will then interrupt this computer and then allow you to uh, do some debugging and stuff like that. That is a mess. So I don't even know if I'll be able to like bend this all back. But the other problem is, of course, is this ribbon cable has that cut in it which I might be able to fix if I like very carefully kind of like straight away the plastic and then put a little bodge in there. Or I could just run an extra wire, to be honest. Um, I could just test continuity from there to there. Thing is, I don't know what kind of software that this Periscope needs. That is obviously something I don't have. This box is now empty, so there is no software to be had here. And obviously this is like super high level debugging stuff, but it would be really, really freaking cool if we could get this working and actually get the periscope system set up in a way where we could interrupt the operation of this, like say in the middle of a game or whatever, and then do debugging. How freaking cool would that be? I'm definitely gonna have to rely on my viewers to help find information on the periscope model four here. Maybe people can dig up the manuals, scans of the manuals at least, and the software for this thing. And then if that's the case, then I could try in the future to try to bring this thing back to life. And hopefully some of my viewers watching maybe worked at a company that used these periscopes. I have several other periscope boards. None of them have this big ribbon cable though. They just like have an ISA card and I think and this RCA jack on them. So I'm assuming they allow for some debugging inside the computer the periscope card is plugged into. But again, I don't really know how those cards work. I've never got any of that stuff to work. And I have that all in a separate box full of like weird cards, which is where this will go with those other ones if uh, we never figure out how to make this thing work. Since recording this video, I was able to find a little bit of stuff on the Periscope, including the manual for the Model 4 here. So having the manual for it will go a long way in possibly trying to get this thing working. I also found some software packages here, Periscope 401, 50, 32, and 531. Question is, I have no idea if this software here will work with this Periscope 4 board that we have here. So that's the 531, 401, let's look in here. Oh, it looks a bunch of DOS utilities and stuff like that. And take a look at this Byte Magazine scan from 1990. Here's a little section on the Periscope. So there's the Periscope 4, 25 megahertz, $2,195. And then I guess the Flex Cable Kit, $359. 
Whoa, that's uh, some pricey stuff. So that is it for unboxing everything that's in here. And I guess now what I need to do is figure out which things I'm gonna do some testing. And then I'm gonna also wash some of those cards that are really dirty and dry them, of course, so that when it is time for testing, they are nice and clean. So we are entering part two or phase two of this video. So I guess that's gonna be it for this video. If you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They make this possible. They literally make my channel possible at this point. So it means so much to me, all the support that I get from them. If you wanna support me, you can do so at the link in the description below. Patrons get early access to videos and other perks and things like that. Uh, definitely comment down below if you recognize any of these cards. You can tell me more about it. I'll be super fascinated to hear about some of this stuff, especially like the weird stuff like those uh, Mac new bus cards and things like that. And then watch for a part two where I bust out those motherboards and we start actually testing some of this stuff. So that's going to be it. Thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.